new environment. But whatever the means used to supply the air, it is important to know how to use air in this water environment. Otherwise, this might happen. Crushing of the entire body. Or this. Internal bleeding from the lungs. Or this. Bleeding in the eyeballs. Or this. Excruciating pain in the ears. Typical of but a few of the difficulties that can occur when one lacks full knowledge and experience in using air in a water environment. The purpose of this film is to explain how underwater swimmers and divers can avoid harm to themselves through knowledge of the properties of water and air. Air and water react quite differently to the application of a weight or pressure. With each increase of pressure, the air volume is reduced but the water volume remains unchanged. In fact, water can withstand a pressure of more than several tons per square inch before showing any appreciable change in volume. This incompressibility of water, coupled with air's readily compressible nature, is the basic cause for all the mechanical problems of diving. like all other gases, has this property. It exerts pressure, which keeps the water from running out of this tube. It exerts this pressure equally in all directions. Furthermore, this air pressure is even transmitted undiminished by water. Actually, the pressure exerted by air, when measured at sea level, is great enough to hold up a column of seawater 33 feet high. Venting this tube allows the water to flow out, which when collected and weighed, amounts to 14 and 7 tenths pounds. In other words, a column of seawater, 33 feet high, which has a cross-sectional area of one square inch, weighs 14 and 7 tenths pounds. Counterbalancing this weight or pressure is the pressure exerted by air, which of course must equal 14 and 7 tenths pounds per square inch. This value is referred to as one atmosphere of pressure. Combining the pressure of air to that of water at a depth of 33 feet gives a total of 29 and 4 tenths pounds per square inch, or two atmospheres. At 66 feet, the total pressure is 44 and 1 tenth pounds, or three atmospheres. Each addition of 33 feet of seawater increases the pressure by 14 and 7 tenths pounds, or one atmosphere. These total pressures are called absolute pressures. Furthermore, the pressure at any depth is exerted equally on a point from all directions. Instruments such as these are used to measure pressure. Under normal atmospheric conditions, each gauge indicates an air pressure of zero, rather than the expected one atmosphere, or 14 and 7 tenths pounds per square inch. This happens because these gauges are designed to show only changes from atmospheric pressure, not the total or absolute pressure. 
The values on such instruments are called gauge pressures. On this scale, gauge pressures are quickly converted to absolute pressures by adding 14 and 7 tenths pounds to each value. And on this scale, by adding one atmosphere to each value. Also, since the pressure of one atmosphere equals the depth of 33 feet, gauge readings can quickly be changed to water depth. With this gauge, let's explore the interaction of air and water pressures. This gauge measures the pressure exerted by the air inside this sealed cylinder. This other, the pressure of the water on the cylinder. Understandably, both gauges now read zero. Below the water, notice that the elastic sides of the cylinder are being pushed inward more and more the deeper we go. Also that as the water increases its pressure against the cylinder, the air inside compresses, so its pressure always equals that exerted by the water. To restore the cylinder to its original volume, more air, under pressure, must be pumped in. But notice that the pressure exerted by this increased volume of air still equals the pressure exerted by the water. In other words, to keep air in a flexible container from changing in volume, the pressure exerted by the air must always balance the pressure being exerted against it. We have also seen that as the volume of the air in the cylinder decreases, its pressure increases. To explore this interesting relationship further, let's carry out another experiment. Here is a one cubic foot container with rigid walls, open at one end and calibrated so changes in its volume can be readily determined. When this container is held at the surface of the water, its air volume is one cubic foot at a gauge pressure of zero which equals, of course, an absolute pressure of one atmosphere. Now, let's go below to a depth of 33 feet. Here, the gauge pressure is 1, which means an absolute pressure of 2 atmospheres. The air in the container is now only one half of its former volume. Going down still further to 66 feet, the gauge reads 2 atmospheres. That is to say, an absolute pressure of three atmospheres. The air volume is now one-third of a cubic foot.
continuing down another 33 feet to 99 feet. The gauge pressure becomes three atmospheres, which is equivalent to an absolute pressure of four atmospheres. The air is now reduced to one-fourth of its original volume. Examining this data more closely, we find that when the absolute pressure of the air is doubled, its volume is halved. While when the pressure increases three times, the volume becomes one-third as large. This inverse relationship between the absolute pressures and volumes of a gas is known as Boyle's Law. Thus, when a cubic foot of air, or any gas at atmospheric pressure, is subjected to an absolute pressure of five atmospheres, its volume reduces to one-fifth of a cubic foot, condition that would occur at a depth of 132 feet. Boyle's law applies during ascent as well as descent. If at six atmospheres of pressure absolute, a volume of gas occupies one cubic foot in a six cubic foot container, open at the bottom, it follows that when the pressure is reduced to only one-third as much, or two atmospheres, its volume becomes three times as great, or in this case, three cubic feet. And when the absolute pressure becomes one atmosphere, or one-sixth of the original amount, the volume expands to a value six times greater than the original volume, or six cubic feet. But how is Boyle's law important to you? Let's see. The lungs of an average diver, when fully inflated with air at normal atmospheric pressure, have a volume of about five liters. As he descends, the increasing pressure of the water acting on the elastic walls of his chest reduces the original volume of five liters in accordance with Boyle's law. Since tests have shown that with the most forceful exhalation, the volume of the lungs cannot be reduced to less than about one liter without injury, it follows, according to Boyle's law, that a diver whose lung volume is five liters at the surface has this volume reduced to one liter at an absolute pressure of five atmospheres or a depth of 132 feet. Should this diver descend much below 132 feet, his lungs would be seriously or fatally damaged. But here's a diver much below 132 feet. He's certainly suffering no ill effects, and his chest appears quite normal in size. How come? This gauge holds the answer. It measures the pressure of the air being breathed. Note that the air pressure equals the pressure the water is exerting upon the chest. Furthermore, this equipment, which supplies the diver with air, adjusts automatically the pressure of the air in the lungs so it always balances the pressure exerted by the water. To maintain this balance, the diver must not interrupt his breathing. If he should, Boyle's law goes to work, and with these balloons, you'll soon see what can happen. This balloon has its mouth open to represent the lungs of a diver who is not holding his breath. This one has it closed and represents a diver holding his breath. As the balloon divers ascend, note what happens to the air volumes. One is getting bigger and bigger in accordance with Boyle's law. But the breathing balloon doesn't change in size since its expanding air can escape, like the air from the lungs of a diver who has not interrupted his breathing. Soon, 
the non-breathing balloon gets so big, it bursts. With this schematic drawing, let's see what would have happened to the diver if he had interrupted his breathing. Inside the lungs, as the body continues to rise, the air expands, pushing out the chest wall and forcing down the diaphragm. The pressure of the air inside the lungs equals the pressure exerted by the water as long as the lungs continue to expand. But when the lungs can no longer expand, a pressure imbalance results, since the water pressure continues to get less and less while the air pressure remains unchanged. This pressure imbalance within the air sacs becomes so great that one or more of them break, allowing air to escape into the pleural cavity. The escaped air is at the same pressure as the air which remains within the lungs, and of course, is greater than the pressure exerted by the water. Upon resumption of breathing, the greater air pressure within the lungs forces air out until its pressure equals the outside pressure. As this happens, the escaped air in the pleural cavity, now exerting greater pressure than the air inside the lungs, continues to expand and collapses the lung. This condition is called pneumothorax, which simply means air in the chest cavity. Interruption of breathing during ascent can cause still another condition. The air sac, when it breaks, may rupture only its own wall and not the lining of the pleural cavity. The air now escapes into the space between the air sacs and the lining which encases the lung. Since air is lighter than the surrounding fluids, it flows upward and inward to a space called the mediastinum. Upon resumption of breathing, the excessive air in the lungs escapes and the captive air expands since an imbalance exists between the pressures inside and outside the body. As the ascent continues, the captive air expands still further and may press on the food tube so as to make swallowing difficult or impossible. Or, it may expand in this direction and press upon vital nerves, such as the one controlling the heart. This condition is called emphysema, or more simply, swelling due to the presence of air. The lung's air sacs are surrounded by a fine network of very small blood vessels, which in cross-section can be represented like this. Thus, when the air sacs overexpand and stretch the blood vessels to where their linings rupture, the escaping air may force air bubbles into the blood. These air bubbles travel with the blood back to the heart. Small air bubbles may join and form larger ones. One of these bubbles may pass into a vessel feeding the heart muscle and block it to cause heart failure. Or the air bubbles may pass through the heart and travel to the brain, where they are certain to cause some circulatory blockage with serious or fatal results. This condition of air bubbles in the blood is called air embolism. Air embolism, emphysema, and pneumothorax are all conditions which can occur during ascent if the diver holds his breath. Holding your breath during descent can also cause injury to the lungs. Because the deeper you go, the greater the water pressure becomes and following Boyle's law, the smaller the air volume within the lungs. With this schematic drawing, let's see what happens. As the diver descends, the increasing water pressure reduces the volume of the lungs by pushing in the chest wall and diaphragm until the lung volume becomes about one liter. Thereafter, further increases in water pressure produce further reductions in air volume 
by causing the air sacs to fill with fluids and blood. This condition is known as lung squeeze. Any diver who coughs up bright red frothy blood and is otherwise all right should be suspected of having received a lung squeeze. A diver can be squeezed even while breathing and descending normally, but then the squeeze occurs in air-filled spaces other than the lungs. Here's how it happens. Normally, when a diver breathes, the air enters not only the lungs, but certain hollow spaces in the head called sinuses and middle ear spaces. The sinuses are reached through small openings in the nose. The middle ear spaces through narrow tubes with openings in the throat. The pressure of the entering air is automatically regulated so it always balances the water pressure exerted upon it. But suppose this tube becomes blocked, as it often does by mucus or an overgrowth of tissue. Then as the diver descends, the outside pressure gets greater and pushes in the eardrum and causes the membrane lining the space to swell, producing intense pain. And finally, the eardrum itself breaks. This condition is called an internal ear squeeze. And plugs, even though there is no internal mucus or tissue blockage. This comes about as follows. When a tight-fitting hood is worn over the head, a pocket of air may be formed between the hood and the eardrum. At the surface, the pressure of this air pocket equals the pressures inside the ear and outside the hood. But as the diver descends, these pressures increase and compress the air pocket by pushing the eardrum outward and the hood covering inward. This action produces intense pain and finally rupture of the eardrum. This condition is called an external ear squeeze. The same condition can occur if earplugs are used. The sinuses, too, are subject to squeeze whenever their openings are blocked by mucus or tissue growth. The blocked sinus, as the diver descends, is subjected from all directions to increasing pressure from the water. This causes the sinus membrane to swell and the sinus to accumulate fluid and blood. This is called a sinus squeeze. With the sinus squeeze, the diver on reaching the surface may notice when he clears his nose a bloody discharge. The external ear squeeze, you'll recall, occurs when an external pocket of air in contact with the body is subjected to a pressure greater than its own. Thus, any piece of gear put on by a diver, such as this suit, or this face mask, which forms an air pocket with the body, can result in a squeeze if a pressure imbalance occurs between the air pocket and the surrounding water. This is an example of the effect of a face squeeze. The discoloration of the skin and eyes are due to internal bleeding from ruptured blood vessels. With this device, the conditions which produce a face squeeze can be simulated. Notice how flush the skin becomes when a pressure imbalance is created between the air pocket and the body. If this imbalance gets too great, the blood vessels rupture. This is an example of a suit squeeze. Notice the discolored welts which make the skin look as if it had been lashed by a whip. The suit squeeze usually occurs because the diver, 
in putting on his suit, fails to smooth out all wrinkles or to wear his diving underwear. And then later, in the water, fails to allow the air in the suit to vent completely before submerging. As a result, when he descends, the water squeezes the suit and the skin for... To review, every diver is subjected to two pressures. One from the water that surrounds him, the other from the air he breathes. The pressure exerted by the water increases with its depth. And correspondingly, the pressure exerted by the air being breathed must be kept in balance. Allowing one or the other of these two pressures to become greater results in bodily injury. For example, if the air pressure gets greater, the result may be pneumothorax. emphysema, or air embolism. While if the water pressure becomes greater than the air inside or outside the body, the result may be a squeeze which crushes the entire body, pinches its outer covering, bruises the face and eyes, ruptures the eardrum, congests the sinuses, or compresses the lungs so they bleed internally. All these injuries can be prevented. When proper precautions are taken to avoid applying pressure unequally to the body, diving, whether it be with scuba or Navy standard dress, will be safe from the heart.